Welcome to the University of Queensland Anthropology Museum for this special closing event. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, traditional owners of past and present. The writ on the body, which was co-curated by Judy Watson and by me, Diana Young, uses material things and images from the past from the collection. Our two panelists today that I'd like to welcome, thank you very much for coming, are Uncle Bob Weddell, the Honorary Elder, who is currently Chair of the Centre for Indigenous Cultural Policy in Brisbane, where his focus is the repatriation of human ancestral remains and cultural property. He's been a major advocate for the repatriation of Aboriginal remains from institutions around the world for many years. And he's also worked for many years as the foundation, the foundation for Aboriginal Island Research Action. Uncle Bob's a high-profile Aboriginal activist who had a lead role in establishing the tent city in Musgrave Park in 1992 when Brisbane was the Games. Um, no. no. It was King George Square. King George Square. Yeah. 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 Michael Ayer was born on the Gold Coast and spent most of his life in the region, the traditional country of his ancestors. He graduated from UQ. Uh, <coughs> Arts, majoring in anthropology in 1990 where he continued his long-term fascination for the photographic representations of Aboriginal people. He's been researching Aboriginal portraits for almost 30 years. In 1996, Michael established Kiara Press, a publishing house which focuses on recording Aboriginal culture and history, often with strong photographic content. Michael was the curator of Aboriginal studies at Queensland Museum. I don't know what your present world is, what is your present world? And his career in anthropologists is including the curating of several exhibitions, including Captured at the Museum of Brisbane and co-curated with Virginia with me at the Bronx. So, the country. So, all the country. So, uh, please welcome both of our speakers today. <laughs> and then Judy Watson is going to loosely chair the proceedings, I think. Uh, Judy is an artist from the Warner people of Northwest Queensland. She's a printmaker, painter, sculptor, and curator. And her work often explores the relationship with traditional country and ground hunger. Her work's attracted national and international acclaim, and she's been commissioned for several high-profile public art projects, including the Sydney International Airport, Belgium Museum, and the Museum de Cay Bromley in Paris. It's interesting to see how the contrast is. Um, and the similarities that um, the exhibition has been put together in a certain way. Um, and it was <coughs> good educational in the sense. And, um, I think uh, the younger youth will get a good understanding about the sort of tools that both societies and civilizations used in the earlier parts of time for their continuous survival. So I think that it's, it's a good idea, it's a good concept. I think it's an argument that some people can quickly grab the grasp of it and what it's about. Um, it to me still is a shame I still have to come to a Eurocentric type institution and to see my cultural material, cultural properties not owned, not controlled, not managed by us in other lives and books and all the rules and the dishes and the pens. My objective and my people's objectives have always been and we've asked this question when I first went to Ferry and they said who owns Aboriginal cultural property? And I reckon some of your academics can answer that because of the laws that exist within this nation and the legislation and what have you that governs the collections within particular collective <coughs> institutions. It's always bothered me and will continue to bother me until we have that restored to us and that it should be in an Aboriginal run and control centre, not a keeping place, but a clearing house. But for traditional owners on their own homelands, they have the choice to have their knowledge centres in their own communities. 
Many of us don't have collections of our own, so we don't have the enjoyment as academics in the disciplines of anthropology and archaeology and students who are studying in that field. We don't. We get invited to a gallery, and then we have the opportunity, unless we come out here with the flags and run on the door and say, well, I'm back, you bastards. <laughs> That's the only way that we are engaged with our cultural properties. So the real question is, in regards to the people in the disciplines of collective institutions, is when are you going to do it? When are you going to restore them back to us? When are you going to let my mother, my father, and my cousins, and everybody else have their own collections so that they can enjoy it? When they want. I see many of these tools that obviously came from where the places that sat down and had a feed, grind some seed, drank some water on a river. Maybe at a ceremony or something like that where the baker was crushed and, and then painted up and those sorts of things. So they're all very significant and always very powerful. <coughs> Through generations. It's not just those who have gone before us. It's a continuous, unbreakable link. However, I do have to be thankful to some anthropologists and linguists that probably only about 10 years ago, I think, I found out exactly who I was, who I was related to, because they were able to be able to do that. But I'm also thankful for my son, Warrabha, who's now been able to identify my skin. I'm here in Dali. So I'm going up, saying the word. So, all the knowledge and all the work that we've done in bringing about awareness, Michael as well, has now allowed the kids of our own children basically now speaking it up and understanding it and probably more educated in our own fields than we would. I have, people used to say, I've got a chip on the show. I don't have one, I have two. And we had to do that. We had to grab the museums by the throat and never let it go and say, empty your cards now. Give back our ancestors, give back all the biological tissue, give us back the secret sacred and ceremonial things. That's my message here. When are we going to have the ownership? When are indigenous peoples throughout the world going to be able to have their collections back? Perhaps in our own tribal museums. There are some examples in, over in New Zealand, in the Titapa. And then we've got down in Albuquerque, in Santa Fe, we have American Indian Control Museums, and then you have the National uh, Museum of Native American Indians. <coughs> and they have a great um, outreach program, community outreach program, that assists in the repatriations and assists Aborigines. So I'm going on to them, can we shut up? But I wanted to sort of hit a, a bit of a, a guide to where I go and what I'm doing and what, what needs to be done. I think that um, it's important for us to take the old people home. There has been a breach of the faith of the dead. And the rights of the dead are very, very important to us. We have been negligent in ourselves, in not being able to perform the customary last rites for our ancestors. So you can understand if you don't bury your mum and your dads or your uncles, your aunties, your grandmas and grandparents, you don't think it's been done properly, then you'll understand what it feels like when you actually do it properly. We took back our ancestors from the museum, the Queensland Museum, in September last year and we laid them to rest. But it had taken us 20 years to basically get that all organised because of all the limitations that we have. 
even though there is a repatriation program and the national repatriation and an international repatriation program, it is very poorly resourced in the sense that why do we still have the collections here? It's because Aboriginal people still land us. They have no legal title to land. We were very lucky that we have a government, a local government, who said, yes, we'd love to see that come home and have those old people lay back in the country. And we had the pastorals of where they come from as well get involved with that and the business people in town. So it was another learning curve for all those people who come from our country. That's disputed, thanks to that title. Um, but the big thing was is that we were able to get them home and we could make a call out to the people who had the traditional knowledge. Even though it's been fractured, people knew some, didn't know the lot and didn't know how to connect it and whatever it was and how to take the ceremony and all those sorts of things, the song and the dance and the carvings, all those sorts of things that we have to do in regards to laying our ancestors to rest and making sure that we are preserving that land. Um, that type of thing. So the repatriation programs within Australia are basically insignificant in regards to how they are helpful towards Aboriginal people. They give the museums probably about hundred thousand dollars a year. That's about all they get. So it's eight hundred thousand dollars a year for the whole national program and the international repatriation program. But there are no one in the museums where the collections are that are out there trying to help Aboriginal people acquire some land back. Who's doing that? Groups like us, who don't get any resources or any funding from the government, and who go out and sit down at the community, go and negotiate with government and try to get government to collaborate and to basically make a contribution. So the holistic approach to repatriation must be seen properly. And so that everybody in our communities can basically build their capacity, good governments, all those sorts of things, workforces within the community. So they can generate work, employment, and work towards some kind of viable economic base. These are the benefits that Aboriginal people can get through. But the bureaucrats and the politicians can't see all this, even though you've got closing the gap and there's heaps of funding and whatever else. It ain't there for the people out there on the country, living on country. Just take, for, for example, the Kalak over in the Kimberley's, the Kimberley Lands Council, War and Cultural Centre. 800 remains are sitting in a shipment container. And they've been sitting there for the last 10 years. And committee after committee and after government after government have made the recommendations to urgently do something about it. So the Kimberley Lands Council people are employed to go out and talk with all the associated groups who have some attachment to those ancestors. And Nalanjiri is another one. They got about three to six hundred remains sitting in their community hall. They can't, haven't been able to use a hall for the last 10 years. So where is the real big effort given? When we see soldiers being brought from overseas, being the diaper veterans, whether they come from the Vietnam War or they come from the Iraq War, there's a fanfare. There's lots of money and whatever else. And we think they deserve every bit of that recognition, that respect and sensitivity that is given to them. But not so for us. So, there needs to be a big change, and it's really academics within these disciplines who can do a lot for us and why working with us to basically restore our responsibility as the traditional owners. If you look at 
um, say the first half of the 1900s from introduction of our Aboriginal protection, first Aboriginal protection policy in 1897 through to 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, I guess, you know, at least up until the 1970s. There's only one way, probably one way to describe how politically how it was for Aboriginal people in Queensland. And I guess you could say it was pretty tough. And Aboriginal people didn't have the luxuries of university educations, forums like sitting in places like this, you know, Rob and I have looked at the microphones. We're in a position of power today in that sense. And that's the position we were, you know, Aboriginal people were not in back. People was back then, people were struggling just to, you know, maintain a place to live, just to get a job, just to, you know, the privilege of having a beer in a pub on a Friday afternoon, those simple things. And then I guess by the 70s, you know, there was as, as Bob was involved, you know, Aboriginal organisations were gaining strength for the first time as Aboriginal organisations, as, as their own Aboriginal um, public identities, uh, entities. And, um, and really, politically, you know, Aboriginal people only first got the political strength to, and the confidence, I guess, as well, to walk into places like this institution, to universities, education departments, schools and challenge um, the quality of the services being delivered in a broader sense but from a cultural point of view and from an education point of view challenging what, what was written in the history books what's being portrayed in museums um, what isn't being you know hung in art galleries and whatever so it's sort of you know in a sense it's only recent it's really <coughs> early 1980s the mid 1980s that, this, that the real political activism really got, got going. I mean, there was people, there was always people there in the decade prior doing the odd thing, but not in any, any sense. So Bob was at, has been at the forefront of that political activity since day one, really. And I've, I've been privileged, I was a lot younger back then, but I'm privileged to be at least sitting there on the sidelines watching it from, from in a sense, the beginning. And, um, and I guess moving on for me, I've had the, have the privilege of being able to get a degree to secure a career and get the privilege of getting, you know, a jobs in a, in, a, in a museum, being in charge. And from 95 to 2000, I was in charge of the Aboriginal collection at the Queen's Museum, which was quite a, quite a privilege. And since then, you know, I've managed to have the privilege of being able to, you know, network and get to know people in the industry and get supported by people in the industry where I can walk into a museum and my great love photographs, I can walk into an institution and I can get access to to history that means a lot to me, my history. I, I know I feel, as a person, quite happy as a person because I have access to, to such a wealth of, of my history. And I've also had the privilege of being able to portray that history in museum exhibitions, in books. And I think I have to continually remind myself how lucky and how fortunate my life is because not many people get the privilege of portraying or articulating where they fit in the world in a public sense. Judy does it every day of the week because that's a job, that's what she does. Bob's been fortunate to do that. Stir things up and stack the people <laughs> and, and people listen. Um, so I think that's, I guess from my perspective, it's that whole thing of feeling very privileged that I have the fortune of having access to stuff in museums. And I guess in turn I probably have a bit of a different opinion in the sense that I'm very, every time I, you know, I'm looking for something, I'm looking for a photo, and I find it. <coughs> so I'm um, very fortunate, you know, just over two months ago to be in the Rivers Museum in, in the UK, feeling how lucky I was to be in that situation. Even more fortunate to be behind the scenes looking at their database, looking at photos in their collection, photos I've seen on the internet for years, to looking at the original photos, having their access is <coughs> an incredible privilege. And I'm, I'm happy with that, that this stuff exists, that these institutions have protected their material. And of course there's been times when I've been angry with these institutions. I know when I first started, you know, when I first left uni, particularly 1991, I was trying to earn a living from doing this research, from doing, trying to produce cultural products. And I, you know, not getting paid a lot of money, small contracts and trying to produce an exhibition or a book or something and walking into places like say the State Library for example, and I'd, I'd, want to get, I'd want to get access to stuff. And I have had a name for all the people that worked there, I used to call them them, you know, those people on the other side of the counter, they were like the enemy, 
they wouldn't give me what I wanted, <laughs> you know. And, um, and I guess I've learned how to, I guess, learn what their systems are, learn how to be nice to people, learn how to, you know, just ask the right questions. And then when I do get access to that material, it's, a, it's an incredible honour and privilege and I feel so grateful. And, and I remember even just sort of two and a half years ago when I was down, I went down to the South Australian Museum trying to get access to the Tindar collection. And I came across, I guess, you know, people who didn't want me there because I, I didn't have direct family from the Tindar. I was with the RNRK, he had direct family. But they were, their policies, you know, indicated that I should basically up on the next plane and go home. They did not want me there. And they made me jump through these hoops to try and get access to this material. And the reason I wanted access to the material was so I could make it accessible to all the Aboriginal people back here in Queensland who can't get on a plane down to South Australia. And, <laughs> and so I was angry with, you know, as recent as two years ago, angry with the way I was being treated by these people on the other side of the counter. And, um, but, it, you know, we got, we got what we wanted, Vernon and I got access to the material with a few, like jumping through a lot of hoops. And I guess using every bit of wit and charm and skill that we've learned over the years on how to be nice to these people and get this stuff out of them. And, um, and then I went back a few months later and, and then I started to, the second trip, I really started to get a grasp on how massive the Tindar archive is and how you can't even put a perimeter on, parameter on it because there's all the other archives, there's all the other scientists that work with Tindar who all had stuff related to him. And I also realised, especially Birdsall's collection, how it was still in its exact order that Birdsall filed all these images, all these files and all these recent races, all research cards and these photos and everything. And, I, and, I, and really, my, again, just another example of my opinion turning around, I, then, I actually really become incredibly grateful to the South Australian Museum for doing such a good job of keeping all this stuff together in perfect order. There's no hasn't been, the collection hasn't been butchered, it hasn't been split up, it hasn't been disintegrated, it's still there. So, so, so um, you could trace it now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, sure people have trouble getting access to it, but at least it's still together. So in the future, hopefully, access will improve. And at least there's a, still this incredible body of information that's, that's clouded with this incredible racist, scientific, you know, stereo, all the stuff that, you know, the, the reason that that material was gathered was, was pretty horrible the motivations for why it's there. But to the families who have some of their own photos, some of those people are still living and they have family, parents and grandparents, they look past that racist, you know, kind of those the racist reasons are there. They just see families and photos. They, they want access to that. So, um, so I was entrusted with getting that stuff and then taking it back to families and then asking, I couldn't really, you know, I couldn't show everyone, you know, there's like 1,100 people in, you know, just in the six months of his work that I was looking at, 1,100 people. I couldn't put that many people's photos up on the walls, but I picked a selection as representatives, and I, I both got the quotes that Tindall recorded in 1938 and the quotes from the families that I went back to <coughs> these photos and asked them what their connection to these photos were. And it really was touching that. You know, there were so many tears. Um, it was such, so emotional. And I think everybody who had been through been going through this journey of discovering these photos. And then when we exhibited the photos, this is the first time these photos have ever been exhibited in such a big public way. And there really was, luckily the State Library put a box of tissues out because there was a lot of tears for the whole three months of the function as well. So it's, it was in some ways doing the exact same thing that Judy's done here. I mean the very fact that Judy's selected artifacts that have been butchered by the museum museology processes of writing on them. It's almost like she's dragging out the dirty linen and saying, this is, this is how these objects have been disrespected in some ways. They've been respected and cared for on one hand, but they've been disrespected. They've been written all over. And also, they're locked up in a museum, as Bob was saying. The community doesn't have free access to them. You have to be fortunate to be have access to a place like this. Just the track. Yeah. I'm just to interrupt there and say it. It wasn't just me working on the exhibition, it was Diana and yeah. all, a lot of the other staff here too, so various people selecting objects and things. I just want to go back to your, uh, the idea of what you were saying, interacting with museums as somebody coming in from the outside, because 
as an artist, and I know I've spoken to other artists too, they've found this too, and I'm sure not just for artists, but for other people going through. And Sam Watson actually had a really good way of putting it. He said, because I call them the gate cleaners, you know, people in the museum who, sometimes it's like that, and sometimes they'll let you through. And it, it really depends on the person, or it depends on you, or depends on the premise of the museum, or whatever. But Sam was saying that, artists and maybe for people like you as well, um, should just be recognised as being sort of like the bards of the messengers and they should be allowed access through because they're carrying the messages through to, you know, other generations and, and the communities. And so it's just that idea of having trust to allow somebody in so that they can actually get through because it's very, very hard sometimes and, you know, especially if you're shy and you're mistrustful of museums and all that sort of, or any institutions, then trying to get through and get access. And so, you know, this this situation has been great, you know, working with everybody here, but I know that not every uh, space is going to be like that. But I would say that um, I'd encourage, and that's what I've been saying to people, anyone who uh, thinks that they, they might have sort of, you know, objects in the collection from their country to come and, you know, sort of contact the staff here and, you know, I'm sure they'll be sort of allowed in to look at objects. I mean, Diana, I'm sure you would. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I think the other thing is too, there seems to be more artists and probably curators and all the rest of it being brought in Indigenous people who are, I see, literally going into rattled bones of museums. And I think that's that's what our job probably is, is just to shake up, um, you know, preconceptions and... Anyway, do you want to speak about that anymore? Yes, uh, over the years, and Michael mentioned that, that was quite significant where Indigenous nations did come together over in South Dakota. And we were even honoured to be able to go and put down some of the people from Florida who didn't have country or didn't feel that they would be preserved after. And so the people at Wounded Knee said, you can put them in our country. So the dual arrangement and the dual agreements of talking about they've got to go back to the land they mother. <coughs> they knew that that's where they needed to be. Over those years, I think we probably brought back, this is an Aboriginal control project, not the government's control project. We're talking about the fair of the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre and working with the Nalanjiri and the Kimberley Lands Councils and those guys and the people up in from Mananjum. And old man Maljali was one of the fellows who travelled with us. And we talked all about that on our little trips around America. And when we went over to Edinburgh, my, me and Mansell first went over in 1990. We were paid by the BBC to go over and to do a documentary in the Third Eye in, in Ireland who wanted to hear it. That was the only way we were going to get out of there. No one over here was going to give us any money to go get on that aeroplane and stay out in there for two weeks. So we had to believe that we had the opportunity at that stage to make sure that that was an international exposure about the collections of Aborigines over there the UK and throughout Europe and anywhere else. <coughs> During that time, and because of the relationships we were able to build with embassies and consulates, as well as personnel within the museums in those UK, they started changing their attitudes and wanted to deal more with Aborigines because they wanted their Aboriginal representative view in their exhibitions and their understandings in regards to all these things. So through the time of working with Farah and um, for the work that we've done with the, the Centre for Indigenous Cultural Policy, it sounds like an association of Farah Fold and sort of thing. And, um, once ATSIC went, then all the money was taken <coughs> from Aboriginal controlled programs, and especially the repatriation program. But all in all, during that period of time, we probably brought back 2,000 ancestor remains. These blokes who are doing it now are just living off the credit that what we've done in the negotiations and loosening the drawers and cupboards over there that we've kept a jar. 
in those particular institutions and those personnel who are willing to do that. So they haven't gone too far in those areas. Very limited amount of ancestor remains that, uh, that have come back. <coughs> in Australia, I don't know whether you know, there's about 10,000 unprovinced ancestor remains. There's about 7,500 um, secret sacred objects that are unprovinced. Where are they going to go? How's the government going to know the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative view if they don't allow us to go out and sit down with the people and explain it and so that they can have time and days to work out what would be appropriate? I just mentioned the situation with the people from Florida and the, and the people in Wounded Knee come to an agreement so that those old people can have their last rights and be placed in the final resting place where they know that they will be cared for. In regards to our repatriation of the communal Illinois people out in the southwest of the Balong River, we've got Kuma, we've got Man and Nancy, and we've got Gundari. We brought those tribes together when we sat down and said what we wanted to do, and they said what they wanted to do. They wanted their stuff back. Too. It was Anna Bly's government who basically gave us a number of contracts for the next couple of years to basically continue putting their plans together on repatriation and helping them put together the, those, those ceremonies and getting them land back and those sorts of things. But the very important thing was is that there was a dual arrangement. They come down and they said, that's your country below Surat. We won't go below Surat. The other ones will say, you've come down this way, we only go to um, Old Kashmir West, and that's our burial trees. They knew that. They knew where the ceremony we were, and they knew where the people who were responsible for conducting that ceremony. And then the Kuma basically said, you look after that side of the river, we look after this side of the river. They all came and participated in the official handback of the remains and they came and they were taught the Gumaroi ceremony for that period of time. So it can work. They're talking about placing them in the War Memorial in Britain, in, in Canberra, in the bloody places. All these old ancestors. Because we raised the question and they, they haven't thought for themselves as advisory committees and they're only tokenist advisory committees anyway. And basically, they just thought it was a good idea to put them in keeping place. Well, we were never talking about keeping place. We were talking about a clearing house. And so that there had to be an Aboriginal control centre that had the responsibility for the coordinations of national and international repatriation. So if we've got 10,000 ancestor remains in Australia, after, 10, after 20 years of the program, then what are they not doing right? We don't have a comprehensive database from these museums, <coughs> universities, art galleries. We're getting close to our time, so questions, yes. Yeah, Is there right. anything else you want to say before questions? <coughs> okay, questions? Um, Thanks to um, particularly Michael and Bob for those insights. I think I, I, I think you've, you've both kind of hit the, the nail on the head. That the, the major issue is resourcing. Um, it's really, really difficult to persuade governments that it's worth putting money into the repatriation of human remains back to the Aboriginal people. There's not a lot of votes in it. Um, it's. I, I think a lot of people don't understand. The, the issues. I, I had my students today in at the Queensland Museum meeting with Leonie Coghill to learn about the repatriation program that's going on at the Queensland Museum. And you know, the work that Leonie's doing and, and the visitors like Larissa and, and then your boss, Chantal, is, is really fantastic in terms of the, the forensic work to, to investigate the provenance of, of these remains that have got sometimes single lines associated with them. 
And that's really tough work and it takes a lot of time. Governments are able to fund research projects into human remains. There's just been a, a research project funded at $750,000 over the next five years um, to do some research into 100 human remains. And that's a hell of a lot of money to do the scientific research. But where's the equivalent funding to ensure that these old people go home? And I, I think the questions that Bob and Michael are asking are really important questions because they are the questions of, well, how do we take that next step? Um, I think there's I think there's a lot of goodwill and there's a lot of people who want to see um, Aboriginal people having access again and having materials returned to them if they want them. Not all Aboriginal groups want human remains back, but for those who do, I think there is a lot of goodwill. I know Diana would say in a heartbeat if there were Aboriginal people um, who wanted the remains back held here that that would be possible. But where's the funding? Where's the funding to to do the research to find the, yeah. the provenance for these unprovenanced remains. The universities are basically not part of the repatriation program. It's really for the seven principal museums yeah. throughout the state. But there's and you there's basically got to go and dig up your own money. Yeah, but so and, poorly, even the big yeah. museums yeah. are so poorly funded. Right. And yet there's $750,000 yeah. to do the science, but which, look, in and of itself may not be a problem. but. We just don't seem to be getting the balance right. I think you need to look at this. It should be two problems. It's not just the funding, yeah. the repatriation of remains and the funding. Yeah. It's about getting Aboriginal people in the doors of museums to start. Yeah. That's one of the most important yeah. things. The more, the more events, the more exhibitions, the yeah. more publications that are coming out of museums, that gets people through. And I think that's yeah. where the, the, that's the sorts of exhibitions like this one has been such a great exhibition because it is an exhibition that's, that's it's not an academic exhibition. It's an exhibition about connecting with objects. And I think that's one of the I think that's one of the the, the big advantages of the exhibition that we've got here and, and, and some of the other ones that Diane has designed. And as yes, I thank you. There was just a question I didn't no, the is just comment in that same debate. I mean part of it is with the work that we've all been doing back as far as I can remember like going yeah. into shaking the bushes and getting people stirred up and so on. But also part of it is People who can, whose business business it is to get money by academics doing it, research and academic doing it, um, is to think outside the box and say, okay, well, if we can't get money through here, let's think around outside the square and go to the NHMRC and, and bring together cultural heritage and community health and wellbeing. There's money there. No one that I know is is accessing. I've got friends in the system saying, why aren't you applying for this money? Because yeah. many cases get. More money than God. Well, look, we still have an access, and they do get the money. Yes. Um, those who have science and anatomy and that, they, you, <coughs> know, you can pull out the Royal College of Surgeons register over in London, um, and you can still see who's going over and who's having access and what studies they're actually doing, whether it's um, dentistry or whatever it is. Um, it's recorded and it's identified, and that's it. <coughs> um, but I think what, what you're saying. Is, is right is that it's not just the resources. We don't have the collaboration of the academics. If I went to the meeting now with um, Campbell Newman, I would prefer that I had two or three academics from the institutions who are managing the collections to show that there is an interest and that there is a collaborative approach and there is common ground. And one main common ground was is getting them back to Aboriginal people's ownership, control and management. Yeah. Simple so question. Are there human remains in this museum? There are no Indigenous human remains anymore in this museum. Are there the in other... Well, some of them got repatriated, isn't there? Yeah, there's still some in the question. So, so the question was, are there any uh, Indigenous human remains in, in this museum? No. Are there any university? Sorry. I believe there are not. There are not, but I couldn't say, but I believe there are not. But there are the Queensland Museum. 
and what's the policy, Michael, do you know what the policy is of the Queensland um, Museum towards these remains? I, you know, I charge the policy, but I probably can... Policy is it. just a very general policy, and policies are policy. It's not law to compel museums to have the budget to do it. I mean, there's only the Amy there and one other, isn't it? Just I mean, you s people want to come in there and say, look, we want our fire sticks or we want our curls, what have you. So you can't identify where they are. They're just all stacked and stored on top of one another, mixed up. No one's ever sorted it out at this stage, and that's why we don't have a comprehensive database about what we've got. But Henry Evan Adrian Murray said back in about 1986 that museums and art galleries are in possession of hundreds of thousands of cultural material with a value of over $400 million then. But that was just when they were working with FAIR and they really just touched the surface at that particular stage. So um, I think the real issue is, is yes, the museums are poorly funded. The, um, they can try to repatriate the muse uh, what the museum's got. However, they are basically uh, have to follow the provisions and the regulations of the legislation. So they don't have absolute ownership and control. There's a white fellow always sitting above them who makes the decisions and allows them and tells you what you can and what you can't have back. There's still a position with a lot of collecting institutions we don't want to break up our collection. And that still prevails. All right, there's been a lot of good work done by a lot of other museums and that around the country, but they can only do as limited as much as they can because they don't have the money. And they don't, they've got the normal everyday work that they have to do as workers within a damn museum like anybody else in your own disciplines out here doing your work. To get pulled off that and then to go and try and work out the register of what's inside that museum. And then you think, well, we still can't get them back. And I think you just said that there's a lot of people that don't want them, but I can tell you there's hundreds of them out there, thousands of them, that do want them back, but they can't get them back because they don't have land. And if they even knew that they have cultural material and cultural properties out there, I'm telling you, they want them back. I mean, I travel the length and breadth of this country, and there was people like my diary and um, other people up in Arakoon and wherever else around the place. Been there for years and wanting to see that stuff come back to their place. And, and we'll but I think we're at a crossroads now that if Bob Weather or Michael Ed goes to go and see Campbell Newman or Tony Abbott and he says, what do you want, Bob? Well, I can say what I want, but he's going to say, well, do the, those people in those disciplines are going to be willing to let those things go? Who's going to help us? How's that going to happen? Where is our support from non-Aboriginal academics and well as our Aboriginal academics? And it's good to have Aboriginal people who think UniQuest has got a good program that's going in um, um, social science. So all we need to do is train our people in research, people who can do conservation, preservation, all those sorts of things and have that knowledge all around this country and talking to people and what have you on the repatriation program through FAIR for the last hundred years. People want their stuff home. It's just that they don't have the ability, there's too many limitations, just like getting land. You but know. if you don't have land but you have a keeping place or whatever you want to call it, yeah. can you, is it still better for them to go to their home country and not be buried rather than stay in a cold museum where they're not cared for. That's what I'm I think well, one of the main things is Bob's kept talking, keeps talking about funding. And so many communities are are under fund, I mean don't aren't resourced to even get consensus on, on any on most issues. As you know, there's lots of argument fighting going on in communities over native title and all types of other things. Human remains is only one one issue. It's important to most Aboriginal people, but getting the resources <coughs> and getting, you know, getting people together to, to have these agreements and then proving to the government and to the institutions that these agreements are have happened 
and, and they will be and the, and the institutions are scared that the consultation may, may not be up to standard and they'll be attacked by somebody else so there's a whole lot of things happening and I think I just want to we'll give credit to people like Judy and a whole stack of other artists for years even going back to Gordon Bennett's artwork from the late 1980s where he was talking about this issue of human remains you know reaching a huge audience from an artistic abstract um, point of view, he, he was raising the issue of human remains being locked up in institutions and Judy's done her, her artworks of, of skulls and the, the vessel, I think you call it. And, um, you know, so, so I think that's why I'm, one of the things I love working with the art, in the culture and slash arts industry is working with people like Judy and seeing artists, you know, you've got Bob approaching it from a bureaucratic, you know, and bureaucrat fighting with the bureaucrats that angle. And you've got artists taking on the bureaucrat bureaucracies from a from a completely different angle. So who can them credit? I think it's really important to recognise that what this exhibition I think is trying to achieve is that it's reflecting on the duty of all institutions to create a dialogue about this colonial routine imperative, and that there is an increasing recognition of this dissatisfaction of communities <coughs> about the state of their culture. Thank <laughs> you. 